When I got to college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I majored in marketing because I just finished watching Mad Men and had no media comprehension. But I found a lot of my classes to be technical and theoretical. In any microeconomics class, you are going to hear the phrase, assuming everyone is rational, about a thousand times. To which my unanswered response was, but what about all the times when people aren't rational? What about when people fall for scams? What about when the price of GameStop goes to $400? What about when Taylor Hicks wins American Idol? After a few years of study, I finally got a chance to get some answers. I took a behavioral finance course, which specifically looked at irrationality. To this day, it's one of the best classes I've ever taken, and the backbone of it was this work by Dan Ariely, his book Predictably Irrational. But I'm not making this video because behavioral economics is an interesting field, though it is. And I'm not making this to shill his book, even though I would have recommended it very recently. I'm making this video because a year ago, Dan and Ariely was caught fabricating data. And I think that means a reevaluation of his work is well overdue. Predictably Irrational begins with a compelling anecdote. When Ariely was 18, 70% of his body was covered in burns from a magnesium explosion. His recovery was painful and involved a daily bath where all his bandages were removed, his body was covered in ointment, and new bandages were applied. The nurses took an aggressive approach, removing bandages quickly, all at once, like a uh, waxing. This was immensely painful and forced Ariely to think about how the treatment was administered. By the time I had finished, I realized the nurses in the burn unit were kind and generous individuals with a lot of experience in soaking and removing bandages, but they didn't have the right theory about what would minimize their patient's pain. Now, after research that Ariely describes, but doesn't go into detail about, he argues that the bandages should be removed slower, with less intensity over a longer period of time. This is classic Ariely, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's a tight story, well presented about an important topic. It does, however, reveal a key weakness in Dan's writing, and a challenge that faces anyone who writes about science. There is a tension between creating a clean, tight narrative and the messiness of actually doing science. As the saying goes, data is not the plural of anecdote, but Ariely is enamored with a good story, which helps explain his later actions. A common theme in Dan's work is dishonesty, and he created an influential study with this absolute banger of a title. Signing at the beginning makes ethics salient and decreases dishonest self-reports in comparison to signing at the end. The basic argument is right there in the title. You know those forms where you need to sign something that says, I agree that all the things I've said are true? Ariely argues that these should be printed at the beginning of forms, so people are thinking about it and thinking about being honest while they fill it out. Policymakers love this kind of nudge tactic because you can supposedly get better results without putting any more money into a process, just making a very slight design change. Now, to prove this idea, Ariely devised a field experiment with people signing up for auto insurance. Before signing up for a policy, drivers needed to fill out a form with details about their car, including how much they drove. Now, drivers are incentivized to minimize the amount they drive to lower their insurance premiums, creating a dilemma of whether to be honest or to try to get the benefit of cheaper insurance. Half the people were given a form with an honesty statement at the beginning. Half were given a form with the honesty statement at the end. Now, those with the honesty statement at the beginning supposedly reported driving more miles, implying they were more honest, and proving that the honesty statement is most effective at the beginning of the form. It's a fairly well-designed study with a larger sample size than a lot of what Ariely does. But some researchers noticed something very strange about the data when they got to review it. Now, all credit goes to Data Colada, who did a great job digging into this and undercovering the irregularities. They started this whole ball rolling. And there's a lot weird about the data, but I'm going to focus on two things that make it, in my mind, virtually impossible that it is legitimate. First, the distribution of the values. And second, the lack of rounding. First, 
the distribution of the values. So let's see what we would expect to see in a study like this as a baseline. Here's a graph that shows the distribution of miles driven from the UK Department of Transportation. You may notice this is pretty close to a normal distribution, peaking at around 5,000 to 10,000. Not surprisingly, many more people drive 5 to 10,000 miles a year than drive 40,000 to 50,000 a year. So this is about what we would expect the data to look like. Here's what Dan's data actually looks like. People just as likely to drive 10,000 miles as they are 50,000, and absolutely no one driving more than 50,000 miles. This is not what you expect data to look like if you collected the mileage driven from over 10,000 people. However, this is what you would expect the data to look like if you use the Excel function, rands between, to generate a bunch of numbers that prove your hypothesis. Just create one function with a higher mean for the group that had the honesty pledge at the beginning of the form, and another function with a lower mean for the filthy liars with the pledge at the end of their form. By the way, you actually can create a data set around a normal distribution with a different Excel function that wouldn't look, and I believe this is a scientific term, profoundly busted. Dan, next time you need tips for lying with Excel, reach out to me. My DMs are open. Next, we need to look at the lack of rounding. Because these numbers are self-reported, we would expect some people to round to the nearest 10, 50, or 100 miles to keep things nice and even. Not everyone is going to go out to their odometer and copy the number exactly. But in the second, supposedly self-reported data set, there's no rounding. Each value is just likely to end in a zero as any other digit, which is deeply strange. This, combined with the uniform distribution, supports the idea that someone used the RAND between Excel function to create this data. Now, the data was also in different fonts, which is particularly painful for anyone who works with Excel a lot. There's no reason you would do that. And there's some peculiarities with the different fonts that I won't go into, but I recommend you read the Data Collada blog if you want to learn more. Dan Ariely's explanations have been lacking. He's mostly relied on the fact that he got the data anonymized from the insurance company and tried to pass the blame off on them, though they had no incentive to falsify the data in a way that supported Ariely's hypothesis. What Dan Ariely did isn't, in and of itself, the worst thing in the world. But it casts a shadow on all his other work, much of which I think is valuable. In all his work, he connects narrative to science to tell a compelling story and try to incite change. But often, science resists narrative. It takes some shaving around the edges to make things fit into a neat structure. In that resistance, there's a vacuum that can be filled with dishonest storytellers whose tall tales are infinitely more entertaining than the tedious trial and error of research. Now, sometimes the media plays the role of storyteller, distorting research to make it seem more sensational. Think about studies you've seen where it says chocolate will take seven minutes off your life, or hyping up the future potential of treatments that are actually decades away from application. Ariely has streamlined this process, though. He is both the scientist and the storyteller. As a storyteller, he is engaging, direct, and talented. As a scientist, well, we can't really know how he is as a scientist now. Was this an unfortunate one-off, or will more issues arise with his work? Regardless, this is an excellent cautionary tale about the dangers of dishonesty. That's why I created a study myself about academic dishonesty. I surveyed 10,000 scientists, half of which signed an honesty pledge before they conducted their research, half of which signed after. Those who signed before decreased their fraud quotient by 12%. Wow. Your move, Dan.